recommend to clean really old, dusty, oh. slimy vinyl? Definitely don't use acetone. No. Um, we figured out really quickly that when you use that to clean your metal parts, that if you get that on record, it starts to evaporate. So definitely don't do that. Uh, but no, what do so there are special solutions for, uh, and most of the products, they're not going to ruin your records. Some are better than others. But actually, a uh, something that I use, and I would, I would suggest experimenting with a record you don't care about, is wood glue. Like dilute a wood glue a little bit, like half wood glue, half water, spread it over your record, and then it'll be kind of gummy and peel it off. Yes. Really? Seriously? Yeah. All right. Do that at your own risk. <laughs> It's a it works. Experiment. You have to dilute it like half and half. And you again, have record, you have to experiment record. with it. But use the record the first time one you don't particularly care about, but it absolutely works yeah. better than any other product. So when you say half and half, you mean dip half the record and glue the other half. <laughs> and then, uh, real quick about your recycling that you do um, damaged records, can I drop them off at your guys' place to recycle them? No, unfortunately, we are only able to recycle or reuse the records that we manufacture uh, because we're using the same kind of vinyl that we use in our regular process, so we can mix that back in. Um, there, so it is possible. Like, it, technically, yes. Like, you could bring me records. I could throw them in the in the granulator. I could dry them back up. And I could try and make a record out of it. It wouldn't sound good. So there. Famously, uh, in Jamaica, they would do that with old reggae, uh, dub, and ska records. Uh, they would make literally print the jackets on the inside of cereal boxes, um, and they would take old records and just chip them up and throw them in. The problem with that is that you wind up with paper in there from the label, um, and also because those records have existed and been out in the world, they've got dust and static on them. Um, so yes, unfortunately, we aren't able to do that. I would love to find a way. I mean, we like we technically could, but it would probably wreck our machine, and the record wouldn't sound good. But I do really want to do it because people ask us about it all the time. Well, the other, the other thing is that there's several different um, kinds of PVC that we get from different companies, and you mix those. They all have different formulas. You mix those together. Different melting points. Right, different melting points. They don't tend to not sound as good. Some we're trying to use more and more vinyl that doesn't have lead in it, but a lot of the old, almost all the old PVC has lead in it. Pretty yeah. much all of it. Who do you press records for, and how do you get jobs? Um, press records for a lot of people. I mean, I think that the only limit of what we won't do is if we catch like hate music, we we'll reject that and not press that. But other than that, pretty much anything. I mean, um, we um, fortunately for us, the industry is we're very much in demand. So people come to us; we don't really have to advertise. We do press for some labels that I personally love, like Merge Records, press for Polyvinyl, press for New West in town. We've done some Warner Brothers stuff, uh, Cornelius Chapel. Panic. We did Widespread Panic recently. <laughs> uh, we now do records for this label called Black Hearts, Joan Jett's label. We did uh, Sherry Curie recently, that was her solo album, and we're about to do L7. So there's some bigger stuff that we've done that, that we're pretty proud of in school. And then, but, on, then we've got, you know, there were like Willie Nelson and Waylon Jennings, you know, lots of, I mean, just the stuff we've been able to do, it's been sort of kind of shocking. Yeah, we got sort of more generally, though. I mean, wait, we got what? I'm sorry. Oh, uh, yeah, <laughs> we got Willie Nelson. So, through New West. I already said Willie Nelson. Yeah, we got that pretty early. That was actually pretty shocking. Yeah, we, we all kind of freaked out when we got that one. Uh, but so, based like in a more general sense, though, we um, you know our information is out there, and bands, record labels, or managers are generally who's coming to us to order. So, on a larger scale, you have record labels like Warner Brothers and Merge and Blackheart and Polyvinyl and all those places. And on you know then next down from that, you have managers for larger bands like Blackberry Smoke. Um, I'm trying to think of some of the other management. Well, Weinstein Panic was another example of that. These bands where instead of being on a record label, they have a manager that does it, and then all the way down to bands that want you know a few hundred records because they're trying it out for the first time. Yeah, so one thing we don't do besides hate speech is copyright material. Right. The the person who's trying to press it doesn't have the copyright too, so we're very conscious of that. You need to sign a lot of forms before we make a record. And we've caught a couple. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> there are people that will try to slip it by you, but yeah. we think we've caught them all. So yeah. yeah. There was one. There was one recently that was, it was actually kind of a funny story. 
Well, there were two recently, one that we ended up pressing on that we did. One was like someone mashed up three Led Zeppelin songs on one side. It was a it was a twelve inch single, one song on one side, one song on the other. The other side was uh, the Game of Thrones theme, <laughs> but with uh, you're a mean one, Mr. Grinch. So I go on, so it's like you're a mean one, you're a mean one, you're a mean one, and we're just like. So obviously this person he wants a hundred like two hundred million records. Yeah. He wants white labels, not the script. Obviously doesn't have the rights to this. But and we're talking about they did. right. Sign the form saying he did, but we're talking about Led Zeppelin, one of the most litigious bands you can imagine. HBO, one of the most litigious companies you can imagine, and Disney. <laughs> so we're like, yeah, we're not pressing this. But the other one that we actually did end up pressing was there's this uh, artist named Rutherford Chang. And this is actually really cool. And we were scared to do this, but we found out that he actually had permission to do it. Uh, he took, he, he was famous for buying up copies of First Presence of the White Album uh, by the Beatles. So he took 100 copies of original Presence of the White Album, lined them up, like recorded them all into his computer, lined them up at the beginning, and played 100 copies all on top of each other. So in the beginning, it's, you can tell what it is, but by the end of each side, it, they're out of phase. It's out of sync, out of phase, phase, yeah. and it just becomes noise. So I was running the test pressings on this, and the first thing I heard was back in the USSR, I was like, oh man, not again. Yeah. Like, he texted me in the middle of the night, he was like, well, I got it. We're just pressing a bad version of the White Album. Yeah. But, and I was like, I, I just got the new box set of, of the right. thing. I've been like, ah. And it just what? sounded like the White Album through a bunch of effects or whatever. So we looked into it, and actually, this guy is pretty famous. You Look about Rutherford Chain Company. Just look up 100 copies of the White Album. He's been in Rolling Stones. I guess Paul McCartney and Ringo have been to his showings and they've given him permission. So we actually ended up pressing it. And it was actually really cool. I mean, you don't want to listen to it more than once because it sounds like, sounds like a nightmare. But <laughs> it's, it really It really does. Like once you get like the second or third song in, it sounds like something that'd be on like, you know, Twin Peaks or something. Which is crazy. But, uh, the cover is really cool too. So he superimposed, you know, the white album, like he drew all over it or whatever, and drew hearts on it, or colored the little Beatles thing that popped up. So he superimposed all the artwork on top of each other, all 100. So the cover is a superimposed version. And then there's a poster on the inside that has all 100 copies. So that was really cool. But people have to sign the uh, release form saying that they have the rights to his music, which is usually covers us, but we have to have. Plausible deniability. Yeah. So like if we've recognized right, if we've recognized music like Led Zeppelin or the Beatles, and we then press it even though this person signed the rights forms, we would we could still be sued. The, for example, there was another pressing plan that their third project was a new pressing plan press a Prince album, right? And they were they they have one press. They're a very small operation, smaller than us. And they pressed this Prince album that was after his death and was new material. And well, they got sued. And they didn't think, maybe we shouldn't. You're right, right. Like, why maybe, are they sending yeah, this to us? Like, why would they send the only unreleased Prince material to us? Maybe we shouldn't press this. Right. That's, these are the things we think constantly. Right. What's common sense? Right. Should we make this? You know. They got sued. Um, or, excuse me, they got in trouble, couldn't release it. They were trying to sue the record label that sent it to them, the record label, uh, they lost because they should have known better. And so the thing about the vinyl industry and, and, and the pressing industry is we pay for everything up front. We pay for the PVC before they pay for it. We pay for the, you, sometimes the jackets, sometimes they pay for it first. The center labels, all the stuff, all this money we put into it, usually before we get money from the artists. So, when I said they got sued, they didn't get sued. They sued. They tried to sue for the money back that they spent, and they didn't get it. So they put out, I think it was 10,000 copies. That's a lot of money that they lost on their third project, and almost went under, and they somehow pulled it out. But basically, this go back, it goes back to saying, like, we'll, we'll, we'll press pretty much anything, but like, don't try to send us, like, you know, Toys in the Attic by yeah. Aerosmith. We're watching you guys. <laughs> Nobody out here do that. So, are you talking about not set, not setting it on? You can do that for a little bit, but um, the thing about it is, is the, the center of the record is thicker than the outer edges. 
So if you put a bunch of them on top of each other, the edges will sort of droop down. We have this problem at the plant whenever they're stacked and cool because they're still a little bit warm and we have to fight that. So, you know, if you leave it there like that for a week or maybe a couple days, it's fine. But you don't want to leave it that, that way for a long time. And plus, the pressure from all the other records on top of each other around the edges, it'll start to droop a little bit. Now, it will start to wreck your jackets too. It will also wreck your jackets. And that brings up another interesting point, or at least it's interesting to me. Um, uh, there's a lot of talk. There's a lot. There's a lot of talk about 180 gram audio file records. Um, <laughs> yeah, just, yeah, they just said, "Here we go." Everybody, uh, <laughs> it, it, it relates to the warping. Um, Hold on, let me find a soapbox. Right, right. It relates to the warping. Just as consumers, there's no difference between 180 gram and 140 gram. The only difference is is that 180 grams heavier. And it's a little harder to make. It's harder to make. A more we to make, make more money off of it, so if you want to make 180 grams, we're happy to do it. To do it yeah. But um, what, the reason that they moved to 180 gram is in the 90s, um, records went out of style. And so the record companies were trying to find ways to spend less and less money on records. So the way that they did it is they put less EPC in. So records got down to like 70 grams. Like you could literally hold up and see through it. It feels almost like a flexi disc. You guys ever seen flexi discs? RCA more. Dynaflex records from right. the late seventies and eighties, where you can hold them on the sides and go. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Right. They uh, actually make that sound. So our center is one hundred forty gram. At that point, it's already heavy enough. Whenever it's around seventy grams, it'll slide around the turntable. Whenever it's it's, it's going around, it's like how you used to have to put a penny on a flexi disc. Right. Or, you know. So at that point, it made sense for one hundred eighty grams because then it would spin around the record. But the difference here is, like, at 140 grams, it's not going to do that anymore. At 140 grams, it's about the time where if something gets warped, you can stack it between several books and leave it there for a couple days, and it'll most likely become unwarped depending on how warped it is. But at 180 grams, if it gets warped, that's it, it's done. You can't really unwarp it. So there are actually benefits to 140 grams over 180 grams. And same standards for either way. I mean, the, Grooves aren't any deeper, they're not cut any different. We literally can take samples from one uh, mold, set of molds that we do 140 gram on, move those samples to 180 gram, and it's the depth of the mold. It has nothing to do with the samples. The samples are exactly the same, they're not cut any different, they're not cut any more audio file or anything like that. It's just a heavier record, that's literally it. There's just more space horizontally between the grooves. Right. Anybody else? Go ahead. I can't hear you again. Oh. If you ruin your records, you play them on like an entry level $100 turntable or something. Like that. Right. So yeah. Right. That's not exciting. I, I said that. Yeah. 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 It's not so much about the turntable. Yes, you can. It's not so much about the turntable as it is about the stylus, though. So, um, a lot of people that are in pressing and run pressing plants really uh, dislike entry level turntables. We do not say that because uh, without entry level turntables we wouldn't have new people getting interested in, in vinyl. Uh, what I will say though, um, we at the plant have all different kinds of turntables. People will come in and say, why don't you have a $20,000 turntable? And I would say it's because none of our customers do. Maybe one customer has a $20,000 turntable, but I would rather have turntables that represent what most of our customers have. So for listening back, we have everything from you know a $300 turntable down to a $60 turntable. But what I will say is on that $60 turntable, I went and ordered an $11 stylus upgrade. So instead of the $6 stylus that it came with, it was made of plastic, which actually gouges out the vinyl in the record and does over time. So if you were to buy, you know, to name a brand like a Crosley or a Westinghouse or any of those like entry level turntables, they have plastic needles and, and over time they gouge, you know, every time you play it, they gouge more out of it. But you can go on Amazon or any place like that and buy an upgraded needle. I think for the Crosby that we had, it was $11.99 and then it's a diamond stylus. Um, so it doesn't sound as good. Um, and you're dealing with, uh, with a really cheap turntable, one of the main things you're dealing with is it's not playing the record flat all the time uh, because it's not a heavy platter. So you've got plastic and it's vibrating and it's going up and down like this. So you know, one of the things you do at work to make sure that the record isn't warped is watch the tone arm. If the tone arm is going up and down, uh, vertically up and down, that means that it is uh, that it is warped. 
but on a processing turntable or one of those with the lighter, uh, uh, with the lighter, what's that called? Platter. Platter. Yes, the lighter platter. Uh, <laughs> the the record appears it, it appears to be going up and down even when it isn't. So what I would say is, uh, if you want to start out with an entry level turntable like that, that's cool. Do yourself a favor and hook it up to some better speakers because the speakers that are in it are going to be pretty bad. Um, but if you you know, just upgrade to a slightly better needle, you're going to wind up not ruining your records. They also tend to skip a little more. The they do tend to skip. The main, the main reason for that is because the tone arms aren't uh, adjustable. So an adjustable tone arm turntable, you can change the weight, uh, the distance uh, that the weight is to the front or the back of the turntable to make it so that the needle will, will be a little heavier on there. Uh, so all, uh, or turntables like that that don't have an adjustable tone arm, one of the things that we used to do when we had those years ago is like flexi disc, you would tape a penny onto the top of the stylus thing. That would probably still work on a browser or something like that, but I would recommend upgrading the needle, definitely. Are there um, any other opportunities or places in the manufacturing process for improvement of sustainability besides just the material? I was talking about the HD models, we talked about that. I mean, I don't know. I'm not sure. Well, I mean, I just, I don't know that that answers that question. I think it but, does. But I, I will say, before I hand it off to you and you start talking about something I'm not so sure about, <laughs> uh, I will say that, yes, there are certainly plenty of places. One of the places is in the cardboard. Uh, we use a lot of cardboard. Um, and so uh, one of the things that we have found is that you have to, you have to use really thick, uh, reliable cardboard boxes or else your records are going to get ruined on the way. Uh, and then it doesn't matter what we do. You know, honestly, we can make the best records in the world, ship them in crappy boxes, and then it doesn't matter. So, uh, one, you know, we've we've addressed that. Our inner boxes are made of recycled cardboard, 100% uh, recycled. Our outer boxes are made of partially recycled cardboard because you can't get them to be three wall and it's thick with the recycled cardboard. Uh, so there are places like that. Absolutely, there are places where plastic is used and cardboard is used, uh, and we've been trying to address that where we can. Um, People reuse their boxes. Oh, that is, yeah, that's another good thing, too. Um, you know, in in the life of a record, there are a lot of boxes that go into that. So the jackets come in boxes. Those boxes are generally kind of crappy. They always just get recycled. We can't really do something because they're very thin. Um, but the record, the boxes that we ship our records out in, we frequently hear back from people that they're using those to transport the records to shows. We found um, some bands on record labels where we didn't press that band's record, but press other records for the label, they send all their touring bands out with our boxes because they're super durable. So there's that, and now he's going to talk about Our boxes are different. We'll so we don't know enough about this topic. Well, no, no, I'm, I'm curious to see how it's answered. Well, I think, yeah, it's going to Okay. So, I'm excited. So, we don't know a lot about this. This is the next step. To be fair, I don't think the people doing it know. Yeah, and, 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 yeah, that's true. So what he said is, well, the people doing it may not know what they're doing either. But this microplating process when you're making these stampers is not the best thing for the market. Electroplating has some nasty chemicals involved with it. Um, to get this fine resolution, it's the only way we can do it right now. And what they're looking at is 3D printing the stampers. Um, and we were just talking about, can we get that kind of resolution on the 3D printer? Probably not yet, but maybe someday we can. So that would skip this A, very artistic, but B, not the best environmentally friendly uh, step in this process. So that's, that's where other people are looking. I think our solution of renewable vinyl will probably be you know, easier to, to come by. And, and I, I will say in that, you know, there's, we've heard that Cash and I have heard the HD vinyl team, which is a team out of Germany, talk about this a few times. And it's been very theoretical <laughs> every time they talk about it. But one of the big things that they're talking about is they're talking about replacing these with ceramic. Um, we're concerned about that for a lot of reasons, just because it's going to be more brittle, there's going to be more issues with that. It's also $20,000 per stamp. But one of these costs us $75, and so we can make a thousand records with it, right? It takes about two or three hours to make one of these. It takes 24 hours to make one HD vinyl stamper, and they cost $20,000. And if I was to drop it, and it was going to break, because it's brittle ceramic, that would be a real problem. I could I could pick that up and clean it, and it would probably be okay. I wouldn't want to drop it, so but I could also order another one for seventy five dollars and have it the next day. So yeah. Any more questions? How, how do you know when, when that's not good anymore? 
Um, so the mechanism that wears out is is the heating and cooling over and over again. You know, so you've got the high pressure, but you've also got the heat cycle, which is you know half of the on the new press is down to 22 seconds, so that's about 11 seconds of the cycle is heat, and then it switches to cooling. So you're talking about expanding and contracting that nickel over and over and over again. So at around a thousand records, you know that it's going to start sounding worse. But the first thing that we look for is stress lines on the stampers. So Usually they come out from the center here, and you'll start to see those on the record. So maybe around you know record seven, eight, nine hundred, you'll start to see a little line coming through here, and that's fine. It's not a problem unless it gets into the grooves, and then it's going to manifest as a click. So if you're lucky enough to get the first dozen or so, then are they going to sound better than the last? Not necessarily, because here's the other thing: is what if if I'm making three thousand records, I have three sets of stampers, so that there's that, right? But then there's also the first few records we find need to be broken, the stampers kind of need to be broken in. So it's usually somewhere in that a few hundred records in. So, and I always, like people will say like, oh, look for the number, like try to find the matrix number that says that it was the first pressing or whatever. None of that stuff matters. Because the other thing can be that at the time that one record was made, a fly flew in the press. And it got pressed into the record, and the record sounds terrible. <laughs> like literally anything can happen. It's amazing. Because the other thing is, you know, we say these last for a thousand records. These also could last for two records if one of the screws in the machine fell out and fell into it and scratched it, right? And that happens too. So that's. Who knows the last for two thousand? Yeah, no. It's possible. I have. I have. Yeah, you've done that before, right? I made two thousand records in one set before. It's possible. I'm gonna go back to the sustainability thing. One more time because we are doing something more sustainable by switching to these automated presses where you can see electricity everything much more efficiently than the manual presses. So um, we have really low power. But I'm, I'm shocked. I'm an energy management, an uh, energy manager too, and I'm shocked how low our bills are. He estimated that it would be double what it is. Yeah. So when I when we were when we were budgeting for the plant, I was using the old data from the old presses for both steam and electricity. I doubled what we ended up using. So we're actually using half as much electricity. Which is great. It's yeah. Great. Well, also about the uh, used records as compared to streaming. Yeah, we were talking about that too. So there is a study out there, and, and the data is not that solid yet, but um, it's looking at the life cycle of vinyl and CDs and streaming. And they unfortunately didn't go all the way with the study and finish it. They only went to CDs and streaming. It takes a lot of cooling to cool down the servers that are streaming your, your songs from Spotify, right? So what they did show is that after 27 listens to a full CD, it's actually more environmentally friendly to use a CD than a stream, which is really depressing, right? Because you're streaming all the time, listening to it hundreds of times. Once you hit that 27 mark, you're actually damaging the environment based uh, as compared to listening to a CD. They did go all the way and figure out what it is for vinyl, unfortunately. And I wanted to show those numbers. It's about 0.5 kilograms of CO2 per vinyl embodied in the record. So you have to look at the difference, you know, how much each play on the streaming uh, costs you in terms of CO2 and how much each play on the vinyl costs you. I don't know why they didn't finish the study, but I cannot find the data to finish that study. I would love to but say, if you listen to a record 50 times, it's better than streaming. That'd be great to say, but we don't know. Did the CD part of that, did they show, did they account for like the transportation and manufacturing? Yeah, so when you do a life cycle analysis, you okay. do all that. Like they, yeah. you wherever, I mean, draw your box wherever you want. So I would hope that they included all the transportation. Too. But it's not, it's, it's, it's uh, BBC, it's not a like, scientific study, so we don't really know oh. what it is. Damn. Well, <laughs> that's some shade on the BBC. I mean, it's not a scientific journal. It's the British like, Broadcasting like, Corporation. Yeah, it's sure. It's an entire country. <laughs> They're in with big CD. <laughs> <laughs> They're in with big CD. Uh, anybody else? I'm sure we can find something else to say. But well, there is one more thing I'm just going to do. So, something. I've, I, I've been a record player my whole life, well, since about 15. And there was a couple of things that I found really interesting, maybe you guys will, maybe you won't, whenever I started getting into this, talking about like, uh, meeting people who cut lacquers. And there was two things. I was in this theory that the hits were number two and number seven on the album, right? I never knew why. So, there's a couple of reasons why that might be the case. I'm going to use this as a, though we're a record, but it's not a record, it's a lacquer. When you hold a record, you hold it like this, right? So typically there's 10 to 12 songs on a record. 
So no, number one is going to have your thumbprint on, so you don't want the hit on number one, <laughs> right? So that will distort the sound, so it's typically number two. And when you flip it over, it's usually number six is the second one, but definitely going to be number seven. It's going to be the second one on the second side. That's why the two hits you are the, the typically the second Wait, did song. Did you just say it's because side. of fingerprints? Yes. That is not why it is. <laughs> <laughs> because of inner and outer groove harmonic Get distortion. Up there. Get That's up there. what, hey, Cameron, Cameron told me. That <laughs> Cameron no. knows. I mean, Cameron does cut records uh, this one, but I will say this, there's also such a thing as inner and outer groove harmonic distortion. So the closer you get to the center and the closer you are to the outside, you get distortion in the track. So, um, you know, I will say this, when I'm pressing a record, if somebody makes a really quiet record, it's always going to be a struggle. You're always trying to make sure that none of the ambient sounds in the vinyl are actually getting louder than that. Uh, if you start out with the boom rocking song and end with the boom rocking song, you're never going to have to worry about that inner and outer of harmonic distortion. But, um, but yeah, so. But I mean, it might be fingerprints. I don't know. Uh, well, according to the camera, the other thing is the reason that uh, uh, like acoustic e songs are on the last bits is they're trying to squeeze enough information on the records so they can be quieter, shallower grooves whenever it's more acoustic -y. So towards the end of a record, uh, when you're trying to fit all that onto a side, then the grooves don't have to be as wide and as far as spaced apart. So they tend to put, you'll notice an acoustic song towards on the last track of either set. The last song, the last track of a set. Um, or you do really loud songs that you don't care if it's sort of like punk bands or whatever. Uh, the other thing that he told me about was 45s. If you can notice all 45s, they're tinnier than most uh, like records, like on the album or whatever. Um, 45s that with a center hole, large center hole, if you see a large center hole, specifically for a jukebox, you don't need a large center hole for your turn. Uh, there's not really any reason to have large center holes anymore. Some people like it because it's traditional, or they want to put it in a jukebox. But the reason that they were cut tinnier with more high end is because when you put it in a uh, jukebox, you're in a bar, you're in a bar with a loud crowd or whatever. The low end doesn't tend to travel as much, whereas the high end does. So they cut it with a much more high end so that it travels in a, in a loud, crowded bar. Which, those are two things that I never thought about before. It makes total sense, and I thought it was kind of crazy and interesting. Very cool. Okay, we're gonna wrap it up if you have um, questions for these guys. I think they're probably gonna hang out for a little bit more. Real quick, we have uh, some survey cards. We have, do have a little bit of grant money from the NSF, but it's dependent on getting data about these science cafes. So please fill these out. Um, don't lie. It needs to be accurate. Um, and yeah, let's give uh, one big round of applause for our speakers. Thank you.